another darling of them. <clears throat> Yeah, Bob can't, uh, he doesn't know the pedestrians have right away, but he sure knows how to keep you guys on time. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Alright, so now we're going to talk about the insects. Uh, and again, you know, and I, I thought when I was younger, uh, was I going to be an invertebrate zoologist and, and be a diver off the coast and learn about the invertebrates there, or be an entomologist? And I just was too fascinated. I even got a uh, videotape camera to do videotaping of insect behavior, but I also got a case to hold the camera to go into the ocean and, and film uh, while I was diving, and that was very cool. But my choice finally was, you know, that was my first love was the insects, so I stuck with it. And the insects are incredibly diverse all over the planet, and more or less there are more insects on the planet than any other organism. And if you look at the real tiny things, now we're talking about things that they can't really count effectively, that are, you know, microbes and roundworms, things like that are in the trillions. But uh, the insects, as far as an organism like this, is, is the most prolific on the entire planet and incredibly diverse. So why are they successful? Well, there's a number of reasons for it. One is that uh, they can fly, you know, so here you have that, like I keep emphasizing, a creepy, crawly, crunchy organism that can fly and disperse itself into different environments. And then it will adapt to those environments. And so it's very adaptable. So uh, a great number of species, I'll show you a, a pie chart here in just a second, about half of all living organisms are insects. And that, you know, I'm biased because it's insects. But like I said, if we use roundworms or something, in numerically, the roundworms would probably overwhelm them. Uh, in fact, probably two worms in the ocean probably is much more than any of the other insects as well. Except maybe okay. ants, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Uh, the largest group taxonomically are the beetles. So there's basically a beetle for everything you can think of. There's a beetle for the soil, there's a beetle for a tree, and there's a beetle for every tree, a different beetle. There's a beetle for every plant. Is, uh, I mean, it's just amazing. The beetles are so diverse on the planet, it's incredible. Uh, the, followed by then the butterfly, different kinds of butterflies and moths, different kinds of wasps, ants, and bees, and then flies. So pretty much pretty diverse across the entire planet. This is so old. I've been giving this for a long time. And this, so this says uh, 800,000 to a million species. This is in my entomology book that I learned in 1980. And then it's, so then, I don't know, it was probably 10 years ago, I wrote in 30 million. And now they're estimating it's, it's so far more than that because we're using the genomics uh, to determine species that it's, it's a joke what we really don't know about this planet. It's really incredible. And I, the number of species per day or year that we find is just incredible as well. Very diverse, okay, small size, very productive, so high reproductive potential, a very short generation time for many insects. So with some insects, like the aphids that I did in studies in greenhouses, it's three days that you have another generation of aphids coming up on the plant. That's pretty fast. Uh, they can handle really tough environmental extremes through dormancy or diapause and then estivation. <laughs> There's a difference here, diapause and estivation. Uh, for instance, in the, in the heat of the summer in the chaparral, they estivate, and whereas in the cold in the winter, they can diapause and, and take the extreme. So there's a difference there between uh, diapausing and estivation. So they adapt to changing conditions. So let's say they've adapted to an environment, and all of a sudden the environment goes from tropical to subtropical, they can adapt to that. And they disperse by flight, like I mentioned. So this is the reason why uh, invasive insects are so much of a problem. And it's because when they come to an area that they're not typically <coughs> found in, they can adapt to it. They find new plants that they haven't used for their, as hosts in their native range. And their natural enemies are not in the new range. So they adapt and they proliferate and explode and go crazy and they destroy uh, incredible numbers of plants in our environment. And the list is so long it's not even 
hardly worth talking about. Uh, how bad it could be, like the Asian citrus salad, which may, and I, and I keep saying this, and it's happened in Florida, but, uh, and Jennifer can confirm some of this, but landscape or backyard citrus will just flat out disappear. And it's because of the regulations that's going to happen to the citrus nursery industry, not being able to move plants. And then when you get it in your environment, if the Asian citrus solid has a disease that lands on your plant, in three to five years, it's going to be dead anyway. And your fruit is all bitter, so you're not going to use the fruit. We're not going to have citrus in the backyard. So we're hoping to stop that, but it's it's doesn't look so good at the moment. So here's that pie chart. So um, right here you can see the, the snails and slugs are right here. All other arthropods, spiders and centipedes are right here. And then that cordata. And right here we start with the flies and go all the way around to the grasshoppers. If we put all the animals in a pie, uh, this much of the pie would be insects. <coughs> they are incredibly important in our environment. And I, I mean, I can't emphasize it enough. They're at the bottom of the food chain for a lot of animals. And so, I, and I think that's incredibly important. But they are in all ecosystems. Basically, they eat plants. They are predators. They are decomposers. And I've heard this statistic before when I was uh, young, but if we didn't have flies, we would be walking in carcasses because the animals would not be decaying fast enough in our environment. They're pollinators. They're vectors of many diseases, and then, you know, this is really big, the forensic entomologists, uh, literally, you know, they can take, um, they use pigs because they're so related to humans uh, from a, a biological standpoint, but they'll, they have these pig farms in, uh, I think it's Kentucky and Washington, where they lay the pigs out, and then on an hourly basis, they're looking at what organisms attack that dead pig, and by doing that, they can determine forensically with a human that's been killed or that has died, how long it's been in that spot by the types of insects that are on it. It's pretty amazing. And a world without insects uh, would not survive at this point. There's just no way. Violence in our, in our organisms. I love this. I get questions. The, the, the common questions are, you know, why are there flies? Or why are there mosquitoes? You know? And it's, if we didn't have mosquitoes, there'd be almost no fish. Because the mosquitoes are one of their uh, one of the the fry the small fish eat mosquito larvae, and so it's one of their principal foods. Uh, there are other things they can eat, but mosquito larvae are pretty pretty big, and so and it's the bottom of the food chain. So the smaller fry and the other small fish will eat the mosquito larvae, and then the larger fish will eat the smaller fish. So it's at the bottom of the food chain. So I get this asked all the time. And then, you know, I always answer, well, you know, why didn't Noah just swat the two darn flies or mosquitoes? We wouldn't have them now, right? And, uh, okay, so this is important. Bugs are involved in every part of your life. And I'm going to try to illustrate it. So, how many of you like peanut butter? I love peanut butter. Especially, you know, morning and toast, it's warm. And not so oh, I love peanut butter. And uh, ketchup. Okay, girls, ready? Chocolate? Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, those, those three things, and the peanut butter being principal, uh, have more bug parts in it than any of the other foods that we eat. Oh. It's really true. And it's principally because, uh, the, the, like, the peanut will have grubs in the peanut. Well, the food companies have nobody at the end of the conveyor belt pulling the little grub out of the nut before it goes in the bat, and they grind it up like peanut butter. So, so there is a USDA recommended daily allowance of bug parts in your food. It's really true, and you can look that up. It's really true. And so that's why Kraft Foods will hire entomologists, because then they smear the peanut butter on a slide, and they go, oh yeah, there's a couple of head capsules and a little like that. And they, and they go, okay, this has got too many bug parts, we've got to go fix that field and treat the field to keep the bugs off that field of peanuts. Okay? And this is a chocolate? Yeah, oh yeah. Bug parts, it's awesome. All right, so. <laughs> so of course, you know, uh, the, I also brought, you know, uh, crickets. 
So if you want to try some crickets, you can. This one is sour cream and onion flavored, and uh, we have some spicy flavor, Mexican flavors, uh, chocolate covered insects, some crickets and some other things. And so anyway, uh, oh, and this is this is great. Uh, this, I, how many of you go to Costco? And I love buying the bulk almonds. You like bulk almonds, yeah. Costco? How about how about bulk? What's the other one? Yeah, I know, some people are saying, oh, I don't want to hear this. Yeah, it's true. Okay, well, anyway, I have another one. I have, I have pistachios, too. And so I would, I love them. And I'm sitting, I'm going to watch TV, football, or whatever, popping these almonds in my mouth, and all of a sudden, one, one was like, yeah, that's kind of, more like a cotton ball. What's going on? So I pull it out, and, and it was a pupated uh, larvae that had formed a pupa in the almond. And so this was the cocoon that I was chewing on. Yeah. Oh, that's a bummer. So I laid them on. So I, I didn't have any problem with them. I swallowed them, I think. But anyway, I laid, the, I laid them out on the counter, and about one out of every 400 almonds had a caterpillar pupa or caterpillar in it. That was awesome. So I have one right here. This is, oh, they're both in the same one. So there's an almond in here. You can feel free to come up and take a look. And there's a pupil cotton mask sticking out of one end. Then the other one is I love the pistachios. Crack them open, pop them in, and then I crack one open, pop it in. And went, okay, this was not a normal pistachio. So I, I started cracking them open, and about one out of every hundred uh, had a uh, a grub attached to the nut. So it was just part of the nut, but it was it was freeze-dried or cooked, roasted right with the nut, and we're just adding a little bit of protein to it. This is most so if you want to take a look, they're both right here. This is most distressing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a bummer being a scientist sometime, you know, you have to, you have to tell the truth. So, a question, and then we'll go on. Beyond the ones that you're saying that you see, like, for example, the peanut butter, but they're so small, yeah. you're not seeing to the... Yeah. Oh, you wouldn't even know they're there. Right. That's true. That's right. <laughs> so we're going to pretend that they're not. So just pretend they're not there. It's okay to pretend. You can tell your children that too. It's okay to pretend. All right, so they eat the same food we eat. So we need to protect our foods. So that's why food companies and productions, farmers of, of our food, all have to deal with some form of food or, or pest control have no choice. Even the grain out in the field, I mean, we've got some incredible grain problems right now that we've gotten from Russia, and I don't want to go into that. But when the grain's harvested, and it goes into a big bin, there are beetles and moths that will attack that grain. And then, you know, we have to protect those. I, I mean, I can't go into all that, but what I'm saying is that <laughs> they eat the same food that we eat, okay? And so, there's one way it's affecting you, is in your food. And I love this one, too. They eat your house. Yeah. So you have termites in each house. Yeah. You have bugs around the house, like crickets and carpet beetles and fleas. And, and so there's urban entomologists that study bugs around the house. There are agricultural entomologists that study the bugs in agriculture. There are also, like citrus entomologists that only study citrus. There are floriculture entomologists who study floriculture and nursery crops mm -hmm. because the, those plants have to be perfect or they don't get sold. They can't have bugs on them to get sold. Um, and I could go down the list. I mean, it's so long. So in the Department of Entomology at UC Riverside, what we have are a whole lot of biologists from the biology department at UC Riverside. Why? They can't get a job. But you can get a job as an entomologist. Oh. Vector control. There's one right across the hall here. Vector control, Department of Environmental Health, handles mosquitoes, INATs. Uh, the, the new vectors that we've just recently gotten, um, and, you know, I, I could get, there's a long list of new things that we just got. But I, I'm showing you that the insects are involved in everything you do. You just don't recognize it. They're really there. And if you want a job as an entomologist, it's easy to get a job. It's pretty amazing how many biologists come into the department to get a, a second degree or a degree to get a job. Okay, so... Uh, a couple of huge ones, of course, are the urban entomologists, but the medical entomology is, is gigantic at the moment, medical entomology. If you think about the Zika virus, uh, instantly all of the entomologists start studying the mosquitoes and, and the transmission of the virus and so on. 
and there's a huge uh, symposium going on uh, that'll be soon here in Brazil, all run by uh, the, the Entomological Society of America. Uh, indirectly, by uh, food prices can change due to insects. Uh, plants are pollinated uh, a lot of, in a lot of cases by insects. So even the tomato production is done in greenhouses. They bring in uh, bumblebees. They can buy them from Europe. It comes in a box, and it's a colony of bumblebees. They put in their greenhouse to pollinate their tomato plants in the greenhouse. Uh, let's see what else. Huge medical advances. The Drosophila and the genetics is, is exploded. It's all because of insects. And then we have, right now, it's biological control. And for me, my entire career has been dominated by studying invasive insects and the invasive problems, invasive pests. And so uh, I, and I'm blessed because of that, because it has made my career by working on the invasives. Uh, it's just unfortunate we still keep doing what we're doing. All right, so. Uh, I wanted to harp on this just a little bit. So when you see the word side, it's, you know, like we talked about earlier with pod, it's leg. Well, here we have uh, the killers. So insect killers, this is a, a, a side is to kill, to kill insects, to kill mites, to kill <laughs> nematodes, to kill s snails and slugs, and to kill weeds and plants. So when you say a pesticide, it's all of them or any of them. But when you want to be specific, you need to use the right term. And for, in agriculture, we need to do it very specifically because if you give a person a miticide and you're trying to spray an insect, insect to kill it, it's not going to work. So very, very important. Uh, we've already talked about this, so this is where I can uh, move on, along a little bit. Um, we already know about the six legs, the three body parts, and wings. And, okay, nothing else to harp on there. Here's the generic insect. What I mean by generic is this is what all uh, scientists will use to teach other folks about uh, what the body parts of an insect are. There is a head, the thorax, which contains three parts, and then the abdomen. And the three parts are broken up into winged forms. There is no set of wings for the first a down or a, a thoracic segment, but there are wings for the, the, the next two segments in most insects. The housefly has two pairs of wings and then an organ right here that, that helps them for balance. It's called a halter for balance, but not a set of wings. The honeybee has four wings there. So you, that's how you can tell the difference between bees and flies is that the fly will have two wings and bees have four. Bees <laughs> wasps. Okay, and then uh, the largest part of the brain is in the thorax because it's the moving part. And then a small part of the brain up here in the head. The head has two sets of eyes, the compound eyes and three simple eyes. The simple eyes use, are used for a direction. So compound eyes are you're looking for motion and are trying to protect themselves. But simple eyes are used if, in order to get somewhere. In, 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 they can see polarized light from the sun with those three simple eyes. Polarized light from the sun comes down in a straight line. And so they can literally tell what direction they're going in uh, by the direction of the light that's coming. And that's how ants find their colonies and so on. I can go back uh, through a lot of that. Right, let's see what else. That's pretty good. All right. And this is another really important part about the insects is that they go through a metamorphosis. So if they have an exoskeleton, uh, they have to shed their skin to grow. But metamorphosis is unique. Metamorphosis is uh, the, the changing of its shape, of its lifestyle. So there's two main types, but there's actually three. Uh, one is the, uh, the complete metamorphosis, or whole metabolists. This is where they go from an egg, larva, pupa, to an adult. And they go through a very dramatic change. If you just think about a caterpillar and how it goes through a pupa or a cocoon, no, sorry, a chrysalis to a butterfly, you've got a, 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 something that looks like a worm that ends up like a butterfly with long antenna and big wings and so on. Incredible change. And scientifically, they've been doing things that are called microtomes with a cut, uh, I mean, a cellular thin layer of between the, of these insects in the, during their development time. And they still don't have a real good idea on how the metamorphosis works like that with a with a caterpillar to a butterfly. And they know uh, chemically 
how that happens through the juvenile hormones and hormones that are in an insect. But as far as the morphological structure inside the insect and how it transforms, that's still pretty much a mystery at this point. And then there's the incomplete metamorphosis, or the hemimetabolus. The hemimetabolus is a, it's like a grasshopper that hatches, and it gets a little bigger when it sheds, it gets a little bigger when it sheds, it gets a little bigger when it sheds, and finally it sheds and it has wing pads, and then in its next shed it's got wings, it's a full adult. It doesn't go through that dramatic change like a caterpillar <coughs> does, or a fly, or a beetle. Very different. And then, so then there's the last one is ametabolism. Uh, and this is kind of hard to describe as well. It's a silverfish is the big example there. They don't go through a metabolism at all. They just mature. So here's the ametabolus, the silverfish. The hemimetabolus, the example here is the harlequin bug. And then you have the a whole metabolus right here. So the egg, larva, pupa, adult. <laughs> this one is egg, nymph, bigger nymph, adult. And then the silverfish just matures to an adult stage. So uh, the thing I wanted to emphasize here, and the reason why I have this slide about metamorphosis is to show you and when I say the word bug as an entomologist, I'm talking about one family of insects. The rest of them are insects. But when you talk about the bugs or the true bugs, they all have this characteristic. They have this triangle right here. Oh, really? So the wings overlap towards the back. So the wings are overlapping here. And then they have a triangle right there. And there's an enormous number. And we'll, I'll show you some others here in a little while. Those are the true bugs. They can be predatory, they can be parasitic, and they can also be uh, phytophagous, so they can eat plants, and, and most of them cause really bad damage to plants. So we'll talk about some of that. <coughs> Alright, so then, this is the other really key character. It, as uh, master gardeners, you're going to end up with a lot of this. You know, if, you, if you're end up tele answering the telephone or you're getting photos from somebody who's taking an electronic photo and you send it, they send it to you, and they said, I don't know what's causing this damage. The damage on the plant can typically tell you what the insect is that was feeding on it, or at least the type of insect that was feeding on it, and that's due to the mouth parts. So you have the, I'm not going to talk about the house fly which has a spongy mouth part, but if you look at other flies, uh, they can have piercing mouth parts that can cause us problems, they're vectors. Chewing mouth parts, so if the leaf is chewed, it's going to be by an insect that's, that's caught, that can cause chewing damage like a beetle, a leaf-feeding beetle, or a caterpillar. And there's other examples, okay? Um, if you see damage in the center of the leaf, typically, and it doesn't hold always true, it could be a snail or a slug, because they can't grab the edge of a leaf. They like to go in the center of the leaf, and they use their rasp to rasp the leaf to make a hole. And it'll be a round-edged hole rather than a chewed-edged hole. So there are, that's how you can kind of tell differences among the pests that you're, that you're coming in contact with. The one that's the most damaging are those, and this, this is a honeybee example, but this is the same kind of mouth parts. There is a proboscis, and inside the proboscis there is a tiny thin hair uh, filament that they can poke down into a plant really deeply, way down into the parts looking for either the xylem or the phloem in order to feed from. Now, some of these insects with piercing will only pierce a cell. Some of them will go all the way down between cells and find the phloem. Some of them will go through the cells and right to either the phloem or the, or the xylem. All of those are different because some of them will transmit viruses because of that, and some of them can transmit other diseases to the phloem xylem. All right, so those are the most damaging and the most dangerous to plants, are the piercing. Uh, mouth parts. And you can think about that a little with, in, with us, insects with us, those that pierce our skin and, and get into our blood and so on, those are the ones that transmit diseases to us. And I, so let me give you an example. How many of you think that cockroaches are a uh, deadly killer, carry diseases and run across your food and you're all going to die? Okay, of course. <laughs> all right. Good. How many cockroach plagues have you heard about in the entire history of the planet that have killed people? Yeah, none. You know why? They can't carry a warm-blooded disease. They really don't. Um, again, it's another fallacy. You know, you know Orkin and those guys, they're going to go out and they're going to they're gonna tell you you're going to die because you've got cockroaches in your house. And it's not true. And it's the only way you can get sick is if the cockroach ran across some diseased food, ran over your food, and you ate it right away, you might get sick. And that's a pretty slim chance, really. 
Cockroaches are associated with dirty environments. That doesn't make them a disease carrier. Okay, anyway, just, sorry, got a little pet peeve, okay? <laughs> and I love the insects being mimics. Uh, this is one of my favorite things, and I had a, at one time, I had a, an insect box that was all mimics. And uh, this looks like a wasp. But again, remember what I said? They only have two wings, and then there's halteers. This is a fly, but it looks like a wasp. Uh, this is a moth. And when the moth is sitting on its face, it looks like big eyes. Uh, yeah, isn't that cool? There's another moth. I don't think I have a picture. No, I don't. All right. I, there's another moth, and I, it's in one of my other uh, presentations. But when it's sitting on the, on the leaf or on a plant, it looks like a, a jumping spider. Its legs, the wings, pattern on the wing makes it look just exactly like a jumping spider. So predators leave it alone. And then you have the walking stick, so they can be so cryptic that you don't see them, and that is very, very common in the insect world. Uh, this is a what they call a leaf litter butterfly, and, and they lay right in the leaf litter up in the mountains. You, I'm confident you've walked by them and never knew it, because they lay right there looking like a leaf, and if you bother them, they fall over like a leaf, and they lay on their side. <laughs> no, they're really something. The leaf litter, uh, we had a box of those at UC Riverside, and you... They, so they had a box, and they said, okay, find the insects in this box. And we had placed uh, bugs on the bark, so it looked exactly like the bark. Bugs on sand, it looked exactly like the sand. And then the leaf litter bugs on the, on the plant, and, it looked, and laying some leaves around that branch. And which ones are the leaves and which ones are the butterfly? That was cool. Very cool stuff. Anyway, all right. Okay, so, so now I have about 45 minutes to go through uh, 32 orders or so. <laughs> Depends on uh, who you talk to. And I, I want to do this, uh, I'm going to stop at the ones that are very serious pests and talk about certain pests and, and the reasons why you should, you should care and know. And hopefully, in, in your experiences now, as you go through and you're learning as Master Gardener, you'll be able to help other folks with their problems and their pest issues. So that's kind of the goal here, is to just give you a full, well-rounded education of, of, about the insect world. When we're done, obviously we're going to set up some microscopes and so on, and I, hopefully you brought some samples. I brought one sample from my yard, uh, something that's driving me crazy that I have to deal with. Um, and, and I, uh, by the way, and I want to mention this, this is kind of important. So I, work, uh, I support the ornamental plant industry. They're an industry that desperately needs perfect plants in order to sell. And it's been demonstrated over and over through surveys and so on, even one very recently, that the plants have to be perfect or they're not going to sell, okay? So they have to keep it perfect. And in order to keep it perfect, they have to use pesticides. If they don't use the pesticides, it's not like, and then, you know, we have some of the folks and it's okay, I'm going to fix your problem, we're going to bring in the natural enemies. The problem is the bugs are still there, the natural enemies are still there, it's still a bug, and the plants don't look so good. And so you're competing with other companies that have perfect plants, and ones that, with the, that are, have the biological control still have damage. And so it just doesn't work that way. Sometimes you have to use pesticides. So in my yard, I don't use pesticides, except against ants. Ants can be the worst darn thing in my yard because they spread the pests, they're, uh, they're on the counters all the time, and they're in my garden and in my orchard and all that, I can't stand it. It's not going to happen. So the ants I treat for uh, to try to kill them, I bait them to try to kill that. But I don't spray any of the other pesticides because I'm not producing them for a, a profit and, tr and a company. I'm, trying to, I'm not trying to make money. I'm trying to just give some extra food for my family. And I sacrifice some of my plants to the insect gods. <laughs> okay? And that's okay. But if I were, and this is a friend of mine, uh, they, they have roses. I don't treat my roses because in one month, the aphids, the hover or the hoverflies, the ladybird beetles, the lacewings, uh, the, the, all the other things that attack aphids, clear them all off. And I don't have to worry about them. After a month, they're all gone. I don't have to think about them anymore. But my friend, their family, they raise show roses. And especially that first one, you're going to cut is the perfect one. You're going to get out to show. And I know we're going to have show flowers here at the fair here real soon. Whole building full of show flowers and so on. I'll bet they street. Because if you want the perfect plant, you're not going to want aphids in the darn thing. You're going to want it to be perfect. So there's a place 
for pesticides. If you're going to grow a monoculture and try to make a profit, we need to use some of those pesticides. And it's where they are not destroying our environment by doing that. They're doing their acreage or their greenhouse to try to control the pests. So there's a lot of misconceptions out there about you know, the pesticides and how bad they are and so on. If I have time, I have made two slides is all uh, to, to talk to you about the neonicotinoid issue because that is a pet peeve of mine <laughs> about the neonicotinoids, the bad science. I have a hour and a half um, seminar that I could give on this thing. Mm -hmm. The research is dominant at this point that the neonicotinoids are not the problem uh, with the honeybees and, and other issues that are out there. And yet all you will see and all you will hear is how bad they are and how they're destroying the environment. And it's not true. Um, there are things, and I've mentioned this in a big panel discussion uh, a year ago or so, <coughs> that I think they should do with the neonicotinoids, that, uh, that changes they should make in the labels and the use of those products that I think are bad. And I think if they made those changes, we'd solve a lot of our problems and the issues that we're talking about right at the moment. But to, to, to take them all away and not allow them to be used as the newest, safest, uh, most effective products at lowest levels is unbelievable to me. And then, because what's going to happen is we have to go back to the bad pesticides that we tried to get rid of in the first place. So, I, I, you know, but all I wanted to do, if I get a chance to show you those slides, is to demonstrate that the late, I mean, the research being conducted in the last couple of months uh, is demonstrating that, that the neonicotinoids are not having the impact on the honeybees that everybody's talking about, that it has a lot more to do with the varroa mites and the, the pesticides that are being used for the varroa mites in honeybee colonies. And it bothers me deeply to listen to uh, beekeepers who believe in their whole heart of hearts that it's the neonicotinoids when they have absolutely no idea, no science behind them, and yet that's all they think that, that the answer is when it's not true. That is very deeply disturbing to me. And the bad science and the, and the, the agenda-driven science. Question? Uh, clarifying. Neonicotinoids? Oh. Uh, okay, so if you haven't read the issue, you read in the news, and I was, I'd be surprised if you haven't, but the, the neonicotinoids are a systemic insecticide that you put in the soil, it goes up through the roots into the plant, it protects the plant from piercing, sucking insects. You can also spray it on, on trees and other things to protect the plants, because it's an insecticide, but it's a systemic property is what makes it really spectacular. Uh, the bad things, in my opinion, about the neonicotinoid systemic insecticides is that they're using it for seed treatments of corn and soybeans, which means they're putting it in large amounts on the seed, so that way as the plant grows, the most susceptible part of a corn and soybean is when it's this big. Right. And so if you've got the seed taking up the pesticide, it protects it from all the things that are going to attack it. You're talking okay. about BT? I'm sorry? You're talking about BT? No. So BT is very different. That's, that's an organic product that's a... Bacillus thuringiensis, it's a byproduct of that bacteria. Yeah. And so it's an or, it's a organic product. The neonicotinoid is a synthetic insecticide mm -hmm. based on the ne nicotine uh, molecule. And nicotine is extremely toxic, to even to you and I. Okay, so the neonicotinoid insecticides, and the, so the issue is that the, and, and I hear this all the time, the systemic properties of that is poisoning the tree, poisoning the birds that land on the tree, killing the insects and killing the honeybees, and the honeybee collapse, collapse, colony collapse disorder and the honeybee decline is all due to the neonicotinoids, and that's absolutely false. And I'm saying emphatically just to try to get it across, but scientifically it's the truth as well, and I hopefully I can show it to you. All right, uh, off my soapbox, back to the bugs. <laughs> Okay, so the uh, first one is honeybees. Well, again, the Hymenoptera, so this is the first order of insects that I wanted to bring up, is a whole metabolist, so they go through the full uh, metamorphosis from egg, larva, to a pupa in their cell, and then they emerge as an adult. The queen is right here, I believe, right there. Very large abdomen on the queen, stick it down and then lay it. She can lay a thousand eggs, uh, I mean, real, almost in a day. She do a thousand eggs you wanted to, but her body is just all eggs, basically. 
So, and there's a lot to talk about with the cream. But the thing about the Hymenoptera, the Anspies and wasps, is that they are, they're, they're, again, huge, they're social insects in general. So it's very unique that they have a social structure. And the termites do too, but they're not part of the Hymenoptera. Termites are on their own. So they'll protect their hives and so on. And I've already mentioned that there's a beetle for every plant, a beetle for every or part of the plants in the soil and so on. There's a wasp for every spider. There's a wasp, even there are even wasps. They're called the tenthrodinids that eat plants. It's only one group of the wasps that do that, and they look like a caterpillar. So if you're familiar with it, the rose slug is actually a wasp caterpillar, more or less that's feeding on the rose leaves. So it's unique, but the rose slugs, so if you look that up, you'll see it's kind of a unique looking thing. But the hymenoptera are, are ants, bees, and wasps, and there's a wasp for air. So that's why the wasps are good. And I mean, even the ones that are on the, you know, the eaves of the house, they have the, the little, you guys, I know you hate them, the little, make the little paper wasp nest and the little paper wasp. Uh, those are your best friends. They are going around your yard finding every caterpillar they can find because that's the food they use to feed their young and caterpillars. So if you like caterpillars, get rid of those wasps. And I do. That's what I do. Well, my, the wasps see in my yard, I have a butterfly garden and I have butterfly plants. That I love to rear butterflies. I've got rearing going on, passion flowers, and uh, the caterpillars are gone, my passion vine. And they're, they're called the Gulf Fritillary Butterfly, beautiful yeah. butterfly. But these wasps come and take them all. And so I don't even have any to form a pupa and emerge as an adult or, or anything like that. They just they take all of my caterpillars off my plants. They're also the grass. You know, how many of you have seen the little orange skipper butterflies that go on to land tannins? So little tiny little orange butterflies. They, really, they flit around all over the place. Their caterpillars live in the turf. And so that's why those wasps are always running on the turf. They're looking for the caterpillars of that little butterfly in the turf. So they're really good guys. And unless you're really bugging them, they're, they're going to leave you alone because they're only looking for a caterpillar. Yes? Even the rose slug wasps are good? Well, the, no. The, the rose slug is, is, a, is a plant feeder, so it's a phytophagus. Extremely, there's extremely few uh, tenthrodinids that are pests, but there are. There are some big ones, like on oaks and sycamores, uh, where the, the wasp actually you can defoliate plants back east and so on. Nothing like that out here. but. And the rose slug is a common um, ornamental pest that's been spread around. Another question? Will the wasps kill the monarch caterpillar? Will the wasps kill the monarch caterpillar? And yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the toxins in the caterpillars, the wasps can care less. Uh, they have a little bit of I mean, they have venom on their own. So it's not going to harm them at all. So yes, they'll take the monarchs off as well. Um, I, I know a lot of people that rear them, they rear them completely in cages because they can't rear them outside. And they're not just the big wasps, but there are tiny wasps that will sting those caterpillars as well. And you'll have hundreds of wasps coming out of that caterpillar. Mm -hmm. oh. Yes? Do wasps also eat black widows? Because I could swear we had black widows being, but I saw black widows being carried off by neighbor's wasps. <laughs> uh, it's, from the name of the jar, and, and yeah. then we can have a black widow for like years after a wasp infestation. I, I, I am, I am, so she asked if there a, a, a wasp that attacks a black widow. And uh, I have not seen that, and I would have expected to have seen that in my career, a wasp that attack black widows. Um, but I know for a fact there are wasps that attack black widow eggs. So there's a wasp that will sting the egg mass and it, all the wasp larvae will eat the egg lar eggs of the black widow larvae and emerge as wasps. So they're kind of good guys if people don't want black widow around. But I haven't seen the wasp that will carry the black widow away. Um, I have seen birds carry full-size black widows away to feed their young. And, and it's because, of, again, the, it goes into the body, it's digested in the acid in the stomach and the pro it's just protein. It's not envenomating the, the birds, it's feeding the birds. Okay. Oh, this is so cool. If you ever get a chance to go on here, and then maybe you can type in like ant colony in Africa or something like that. What they did, these guys, is they poured uh, two, two or three truckloads of concrete down an ant hole in Africa. And then they dug it up. 
And so you see the guys down there, way down deep into the soil, and they've dug all around all the colony. This is all a colony here. And there's these big basketball-sized chunks in the colony. And every one of those things had a different uh, uh, reason for it. So there was one they were planting uh, seeds that were growing into little seedlings. There was one that had broods. There was one that held water. So it was just totally cool a uh, thing. So they have a whole video on this from the beginning to the end. And I would highly recommend watching it. It's very, very amazing. Uh, what this is demonstrating is that ants are incredibly prolif prolific on the planet and adapt everywhere. But they, they, the numbers of ants are, are all underground. You're only seeing the ones that forage when you see them on the outside of the colony. Just a fascinating thing. Okay, the columbula. Uh, you will get calls about this, or you'll see them, or you'll hear about them. Uh, they will collect uh, when the temperature starts to get warm and things dry out. These little guys will find the moist, cool places to aggregate. And many, many times in San Diego County, a person will call, and they, they say their whole pool is covered by these little things that are hopping, these little fleas that are hopping all over the top of the pool. Well, it's the columbula. They're super tiny, um, very, I mean, less than the 16th, 16th less than the 32nd of an inch long. But if you turn over a board or a, a stone and you start seeing these little gray things hopping around, those are probably the springtails. Very, very common, and they're not a pest, not a problem. They're in the soil. Uh, they, I've even had people have them uh, aggregate in a bathtub because it was a perfect spot for them, cool and dry, and, and they ended up in a bathtub. Or cool and moist is what they need, sorry. So the Columbula, not a problem, but you're going to hear about them. Uh, the silverfish are not a problem typically in Southern California because we have a pretty dry environment. They need kind of molds and things to feed on. And so they, if you have cardboard that gets wet and it's against the ground, that's where you'll typically see them. Sometimes in uh, buildings that have concrete on the bottom, a lot of cardboard on the concrete, you'll see them there. Wherever is moisture is where they're probably going to end up being. Uh, we have one, this guy right here, is very common in Southern California in the chaparral. So they don't look uh, like the silver silverfish. They look more like the chaparral, the dirt around the plants in the chaparral. That's what they look like. And you'll see them running around there if you really look for them. But they're not a pest, not a problem. A kind of a very key character for the silverfish is three cerci. And none of the other insects have three cerci. They all have two if they have cerci. So three cerci. Now the cerci are used, uh, I'll give you an example. If you, if you go like this, there's a wave of air you've just pushed in front of your hand. And that wave of air will hit those things and tell, some, tell that silverfish something's coming to get it, and it will run forward. That's a, it's like a reflex reaction. Cockroaches have exactly the same thing with two cerci. And the air, you go to step on a cockroach, you move against a cockroach, bang, it's gone. Well, how did, why did, how did it know I was, I was coming? How come it was faster than me? Reflex reaction from the air pressure coming down onto the cockroach. The mayflies are not a pest, not a problem. They're in the waters. Uh, it's streams, lakes, and so on. I've seen them at my house recently. They come out in the spring and typically are gone. Some species will come at different times of the summer. Uh, kind of a unique thing about the mayflies is that their whole immature stage is underwater. And then they emerge as an adult when they fly. There are many species, especially in the central and eastern United States, they come up, emerge as adults, fly in the air and mate, die on top of the water, and as she's dying, she's laying her eggs. So the whole life cycle is in the immature stage, and their adult stage is less than 24 hours long, and they're laying eggs in the, in the back into the water. So it's a pretty unique life cycle. Uh, the dragonflies are good to have around. Uh, predatory, their legs all face forward, so that as they, they catch their food on the wing, which means they see something flying by, they go catch it with their legs like this and bring it up to their mouth really? and start eating. Yeah, cool. So they're, yeah, they're feeding on the wing, it's called where they catch their food on the wing and they feed on the wing. So they feed while they're flying. So if they, if they stop and land, they can't feed anymore. So they're feeding while they're flying. So it's uh, that kind of thing. They're also territorial. So typically, if you want to have six or eight dragonflies in your yard, you're not going to have them. It's going to be one. And it's going to chase all the other ones away. Okay? And then again, the immature stages of the dragonfly and the damselfly are in the waters. Their nymphal stages are in the water, they're called naiads. So a nymphal stage in the water is called a naiad. Um, the orthoptera, the grasshoppers and crickets, 
typically not a pest problem in general, unless there's a bloom of them. And there can be a bloom uh, that can happen uh, if there's great rains, lots of grass, grasshoppers do wonderful, lay tons of eggs for the next year when it hatches, and the next year they come out and there is no grass, all those grasshoppers then have to find something to eat. They look for your yard or a nursery or a greenhouse or mass production and that's where they go and they can be a problem, but typically not. Crickets on the other hand, uh, they can be a pest in the home, they can be a pest in the garden. The black ones, not the brown ones. The brown ones are, are, are just not very dangerous. or not a pest or a problem at all. It's the black ones like this guy. They can actually be a pretty pretty nasty pest if there's a, lot, a large number of them. And just again, I love these quick stories, but UC Riverside, there's an entomologist studying uh, one species of the black ones like here, the dark brown. And uh, what it does, you know how they all chirp. And the, typically the, what they're doing is they're chirping to attract a mate. And then they mate and then they can they move on. And the female has this long ovipositor they can stick way down into the soil. Well, the, this cricket chirps for the brown cricket. So it chirps to attract the brown cricket. And then when the brown cricket shows up, it has it for dinner. So that's, that's its, its food is the brown cricket. No. But it uses the chirp of the brown cricket to attract it. That's cool. Insect behavior is cool. <laughs> uh, the walking sticks are not a problem, not a pest. Not a pest anywhere in the world except in the rice paddies in the, in the Far East, okay? But the USDA believes that they could be a pest, so they're regulated. So I have to have a permit in order to have the walking sticks, that kind of thing. Yeah, kind of bizarre. But there's a good example of a problem, and that's right here in La Jolla. Uh, a teacher had gotten some Indian walking sticks and decided, well, we're not going to cull them or kill them or freeze them. We'll just let these go. And when she did, what she didn't realize was that most walking sticks are parthenogenetic. Now, what does that mean? That means that they're all girls. And when they lay their eggs, they're all girls. So if you have one insect, and she's a female, and she lays 400 eggs in her lifetime. Those 400 are all girls. When they go up to and become an adult, they all lay 400 eggs. Wow. And they're all girls. You see the, see the point here? Yeah. 400 times 400 times 400. Yeah, and that's kind of what happened down in Oya. We get a, you let it go, you let the one or two or whatever go, and now they've proliferated and they're eating all the plants down there. They seem to like English ivy, which a lot of people say, hey, good, let's get rid of the English ivy. And use the, but anyway, they end up being an invasive pest by letting it go like that. That's not, that wasn't smart. Especially because of the parthenogenesis that they have. And many of the insects are parthenogenetic. And many insects are also haplodiploid. Now, what does that mean? It means that if you have half the gene, you know, normally you need a male, female, you, you put the two genes together, you got a whole DNA. Well, they don't need the whole thing. They only need half. And they're all girls or they're all boys. So haplodiploid depends upon the, on the species. And so the female can lay male eggs if she wants to, or if she's not mated, she'll produce all males. But if she's mated, then she'll produce 50% 50 male, 50 males, 50% females. Wow. So you can see the population is male dominated in order to make sure they end up being uh, mated. But that's really common in the insect world. Very, very unique uh, reproductive strategies by the, by the different insects. Earwigs can be a very serious pest, and both agriculturally, around the home, in the home, around your gardens. Uh, they're a serious pest, believe it or not, on citrus, especially new uh, citrus, new citrus production. You know, the, they have the white tubes around the trunks of the citrus when they first plant them and that's to protect that trunk from other organisms destroying the trunk of the tree. Well, th that's where all this, the, the uh, dermaptera will hide is in that cylinder and then they run up the tree and eat all the brand new growth and then go back into that cylinder at night. And so they, are, they can be quite a pest and they need to be controlled. Uh, these, we have two species in California. One is the European species that doesn't belong here and that's this one. And then there's the one that's native which is a black earwig without wings. That one's normal, native, natural, 
not typically a pest. The European one has wings under these wing pads right here. They're very long, they're as long as the body, so they stick way out and they fly, and so they can disperse themselves really well. They're also eusocial. Now, what does that mean? It means they almost protect their young. Uh, they, they'll lay their eggs, the male and female will stay around the eggs, then when the eggs hatch, the little guys will stay with the mom and dad for a little while, but that's it. So they're not totally social, but they're eusocial. So they have a slightly social structure, but they're a bad, bad guy. And yes, they can pinch. Um, they, I mean, you have to really grab one. I mean, if you really want to, you can grab one, and it'll, it'll probably try to pinch you. Uh, they have, what's worse, in my opinion, is they have a scent gland. So if you grab one, they stink. So they, the scent then releases some chemical on your skin and you, your fingers will stink for hours. Of course, I know, of course. <laughs> I've had plenty of experience. And, um, but that is a worn out birds again. It's to keep the birds away from eating them. So that's why they end up, they proliferate, they go crazy. So one method of handling them is to put a board in the garden where it's wet. You flip it up and there's, in the daytime, there, it's loaded, and you can take a little hand vacuum and go, <laughs> and you suck it all up, put them in a bag, and throw them away. And you say, like, hey, no pesticides, little hand vac. And you dedicate that because the hand vac smelled a little like the earwig. <laughs> <laughs> you dedicate the hand vac to the earwig. Termites. So I have to talk much about those. The giant hissing cockroaches. <laughs> Yeah, I have one of the, in my box here, I have one of these big ones. It's really big. I wish I, uh, I tried to rear them, and it didn't work for me, so I was, you know, it was too bad. Um, and we talked about cockroaches, so unless you have questions about cockroaches, move on. The praying mantid, so the, okay, a couple things about the praying mantid. Yes, you can buy egg masses, okay? And you can go down a store and buy egg masses. I guarantee you probably already have egg masses in your yard or near your yard already anyway. If you go down and buy egg masses, how many praying mantids do you think will be in your yard? Let's say you get 10 egg masses, 200 per mass. You've got 2,000 praying mantids. You're going to kill every bug in your backyard. How many praying mantids do you think are in your backyard when you've let them all go? That's very good. Just one. They are highly predaceous, but they're also highly territorial. And so the, not only is when they hatch, they're waiting for their brothers and sisters to emerge to get a meal. Oh, uh -huh. They also then disperse, and then as they disperse and they start eating the foods and so on, they'll chase others away. So it ends up finally, in the end of the season, you'll have one. In my yards, I, I, I can't tell you how many egg masses are on my, my back porch, my patio, the posts, my wheelbarrow, and everything else. And, but when they hatch it, when it's done, and I'm going through my whole yard, I find one. And I might find two. And I have seen um, one of my, the big praying mantids, when one of those great big grasshoppers, you ever see those great big grasshoppers, yeah. big brown ones? Yes. It flew across the yard into one of my plants on the other side, and that mantid took off. Why? It was not to get to eat that grasshopper. It was to think it was another praying mantid. It was going to go chase it away. Okay, so that, at least I'm thinking that, but I'm very sure that's what's going on. <laughs> anyway, you can buy all the mantids you want, but you're sorry. I love this too. I'm going to get to the all the ladybird beetles right now too. So how many of you buy ladybird beetles and release them in your yard? No, oh, that's too bad. Okay, so. How many ladybird beetles do you think are going to be in your yard when you get that big container home, you open that sucker up and let it go? How many ladybird beetles stay in your yard? None. Zero. Here's what's going on. You can do this too. You can go up to the mountains and you can get a bucket full of ladybird beetles because that's what they do. And they put them in little containers that are all cute and all that little screen on the top and they'll sell it to you for five bucks. Okay? But here's the thing. They are programmed, programmed to fly down from the mountains into the environment down to where we live in order to feed on the aphids and so on and so forth, okay? That's 60 miles. So when you open that container in your yard, you know what they're doing? They're flying from your house 60 miles in order before they stop and start laying their eggs and do their business. So you, what you need to do is get your neighbors to start buying them and go, you don't know, yourself. Yeah. Because they're not going to be in your yard. They're not going to stay in your yard. I don't care if you put them on top of aphids. They're programmed to fly 60 miles before they start doing anything. So you can buy them ladybird. You know what? I never have to buy ladybird beetles. 
Because they're coming down from the mountains, totally in my yard, fully in incredible numbers. You never have to buy one. All right, sorry. <laughs> You'll never see one unless you are an entomologist and you know what you're looking for up in the mountains, in the duff, and you're moving the materials away. Uh, this is a Zoraptora, and even the entomologists are arguing whether this is an insect or not. In my opinion, I'll just give you an opinion, it's got six legs. It's got three body parts. Oh well, I can do that. Uh, you know, like I said, taxonomists can be a little... All right, anyway. Now, so then the stoneflies, the Plecoptera, very unique insects live their whole life in the streams on rocks. Uh, some people call them rock crawlers because they're real flat against the rocks and the streams and so on. Great for trout and for the young fish and so on, the immature stages here. And then as an adult, they don't live that long, but not like the, uh, the mayflies. They live uh, a while and you can catch them on plants and so on along the streams. Never a pest, never going to be an agricultural issue or anything like that at all. But the helicopter of the stoneflies. These you will see, and you may get calls about them, the Ambioptera. They're very small about a quarter of an inch or less in length. They, in the summertime, they fly onto your lamps, your lamp shades, and they're, they're dark brown. They have the wings, and they're real, real small, real dark, and their front pair of legs are modified to make webs. So that's why they're called web spinners. The females are wingless, and they live under boards and stones. So if you turn over a board and you see little webbing and a little tunnel webbing, that's the embiopters, not spiders. A lot of people think when they turn that over, those are spiders. Those are, are, are called web spinners, very, very common. The other thing is unique, um, they're on the lampshade, a little wind comes by, or if you blow it one, the wings flip up, they're hinged right here, so they flip straight up in the air. And if you see that, you should know, that, okay, that's a web spinner. Not a pest, not a problem. This is the number one agricultural pest in the world because they transmit viruses. And they're cellular feeders. So they poke one cell at a time and suck the juices. By doing that, they're transmitting viruses to the plant, and it is, it, it, that is the most devastating thing that we have. They're highly resistant to insecticides, um, spectacular problems, very difficult to control. How many of you have gone to the flower fields? The number one issue in the flower fields is the, the, the um, Western flower thrips transmission of the tomato spotted wilt virus to the ranunculus that you see on the, on the field, fields. That's the number one problem. Are the true bugs? Uh, seed bugs typically are red. You'll see a lot of them. The red, there's that triangle right there, true bugs. And the, and the taxonomists have grouped this now, uh, the hemiptera or is now the group, but they put the homoptera into the hemiptera. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> okay, so anyway, there's the triangle. Um, the half of them basically are pests, half of them are predators. Many of them are not an agricultural problem. These can be a problem in that people see them, they aggregate in the fall on trees. The whole tree will be red with these bugs. <laughs> or stoops on the side of a concrete stoop or step or underneath boards or bags. Uh, huge numbers, but they're not a problem. They're actually seed feeders, so they're killing a lot of the weed seeds that are in the yard. Uh, the problem ones are things like the, the milkweed bug that are feeding on the milkweed seeds and causing damage to the terminal growth and flowers of milkweeds or the butterfly weed plant. Uh, the milkweed bugs can be a problem. All right, and here's one. I, you know, I, I have a whole presentation, hundreds of photos of the most spectacular bugs on the planet. This is a leaf foot bug, so you can see why it's called a leaf footed bug. Uh, and it, it, it's, if you put this bug on a croton, that has these same colors, you will not see this bug. And yet it's a plant feeder uh, feeding on the, the xylem or phloem. This one's on the, on the xylem. And here's the home after I was just talking about. These are the number one invasive pests on the planet because they're so hard to see, uh, live in the cr cracks and crevices of plants, uh, under duff. Uh, the eggs are so tiny you can't see them. And then we're spreading them all over the planet because of that. And so the number one invasive pests, leaf hoppers, white flies, mealy bugs, those are the kind of pests that are very, very, very serious. Uh, and should always be watching for it and very hard to control. The mealy bugs are really difficult, so can the white flies be. Uh, white flies can be so resistant to insecticides that the cotton industry just disappeared out in the Imperial Valley and the melon industry is always a threat 
because of the number of white flies that are out there. When you drive down the road up in Imperial Valley, your, your windshield could turn white because of the numbers of white flies that you hit when you drive by. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, you won't have to worry about these. And you can go down to the health department and pick some up if you want for a, a collection, if you need it for an insect collection, uh, the biting lice. The chewing lice, on the other hand, uh, they can be in books, so they are known. Uh, good examples would be feather mites, where you have them on the chickens and things like that. <coughs> and then beetles I talked about. You go through metamorphosis, the big white grubs that are in the ground. I found one this morning. Oh, you know, I love this story. Okay, so I put, I get some, for my compost pile, I put pots together and I put seeds in the pot and I grow them under our windowsill. We have a real nice glass windowsill. And then I can put them in the yard, okay? So this morning I get up and I, I, none of the seeds were growing. I thought, what the heck, they're not sowing, what's going on? And this morning I saw a great big, uh, one of those white grubs that feeds on, that turns into the big green fruit beetles in the summer. And it was crawling all around, one was going around, circling in the pot around. And now I know why there's no seeds in there, or no seed uh, production, because it was eating all of those. So anyway, the grubs can be a serious pest, especially in turf. Here's one. So this is uh, a single meal grub. And only one, one grub for this for a whole meal. No doubt about that. Cool. So this is how big they are when you want a rhinoceros beetle. These come from the elephant poop in Africa. Piece of cake. <laughs> Caddis flies are live in the water, live in the water most of the time, so you only see them when they come out. Not a pest, not a problem. Caddis flies, fleas, serious problem all the time. They feed on our blood. They can transmit blood diseases. Okay, and they're a real serious issue. We have really good, really safe pesticides to handle fleas now. So. And I know many of you and I do front line at home for your dogs and cats, dogs especially, mm -hmm. can keep the fleas off. Front line is the neonicotinoid insecticides that nobody wants to use. Put right on your animal, right into its bloodstream. Doesn't harm the animal at all, not even at all. But if the flea feeds on it, they die. If the flea, now the, these poop specks are from the flea. These fall to the ground carpet, and then the, the immature fleas feed on those, and that's how they develop into an adult flea. That's why you can never really get rid of them. Well, the specks have the neonicotinoid in them too, so when the young feed on it, it kills them too. You've eliminated your entire problem. But it's that darn neonicotinoid systemic insecticide. One of the best things that we've ever developed in a long time. I need to, sorry, I need to keep it on because I'm already out of time. You know, these are my, my colleagues every year, every two years, we get together and there's these three ladies, three of my colleagues who do this, they, uh, they will dress up in one way or another. And this time it was flies. So rather than show you a fly, I thought I'd show you my colleagues. Yeah. One of them's from Oregon, one's from uh, New Hampshire. Where's the other one from? Anyway, oh well. What can I say? All right, so the dipter of the flies, uh, when they make a pupa, it's called a puparia. So it's a little different, but it's the same thing. It's a dramatic change from a maggot to an adult. Many agricultural pests, and the most common one here is the leaf mining fly that make the white mines in the leaves. If you, go, if you have any melon plants in your backyard, toward the fall, you'll have the whole melon leaf will be mined with leaves, or, or full of mines that the maggot will make from that fly. It's a very small fly but they can really damage the plant. And you'll never see a scorpion fly. There's one species in Northern California. These are all over the chaparral. They're called snake flies because of their long neck. Very good predators, both as an immature and as an adult. So they're a lot like a green lacewing, but bigger. And they're metallic green, so they're pretty easy to see with the long, that long tail, real clear wings. Oh, these are awesome. Huge, about three or four inches long, big wings, only found in the mountains and big lakes. Called helgramites as an immature, helgramites. And they're great pre uh, food for uh, trout, so if you go fishing, they're great. But you'll never see them, you never have problems, unless you're black lighting for them at night like I do. Uh, the Socopter are in flowers, feeding on pollen. So typically you don't see them and they're not a pest ever. I have not had a sosa that's a pest or a problem. These are good guys. The lacewing. 
I went out this morning and I took a leaf sample I'm going to bring out to show you. It has a bug on it. And uh, my plant that I took that leaf off was loaded with the eggs of the, of the lacer, that long stalk with the little white leg, egg at the end. Really good guys. You'll never see one. This is a, an insect that parasitizes the brown, that wasp, the paper wasp. The body of that insect is inside the body of the wasp. And so it's deriving the nutrients from the blood of the wasp. And then it emerges in an adult from the pupil cases. And then it looks like this. Extremely unique looking insect. Nothing anywhere like it, but it's so tiny and you'll never ever see one. I I've seen only an emerged ones on the backs of the bodies of their wasps. Only if you go to the Arctic will you see this insect. And you have to turn over rocks to find them. The, the grill of that is. And then there's the butterfly. And many agricultural pests, the vast majority of them are moths. And the caterpillars from moths, vast majority, not the, not the butterflies per se. And that's it. So I went over five minutes or four minutes or so, and Bob's already saying, hey, I, I failed the test. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.